Hello and welcome to Our Shakespeare. Today I'd like to do a film review for you. Today I'll be reviewing the film King Lear, the 2018 adaptation directed by Richard Eyre? Eyre? Not sure how to pronounce his last name. Uh, he's best known for Notes on a Scandal and Iris, at least here stateside he is. The film stars Anthony Hopkins as King Lear. It also stars Emma Thompson, em Emily Watson, and Jim Broadbent, among many, many others. It's a BBC production and was originally released in the UK in May of this year. Uh, and then Amazon Prime got a hold of it and has released it here in the United States, and it came out in late September of this year. This is not Anthony Hopkins' first time to play the role of King Lear. He has played it on stage before, as far back as the 1980s. So it's a role that he's been familiar with for quite some time, uh, and has been working for a long time, from what I understand, to adapt it as a film. So it's exciting that he was finally able to do it, now that he is at an age appropriate to be representing King Lear. Uh, to give you an idea of the look and feel of the film, let's watch a little bit of the trailer. No, that we have divided in three our kingdom. It is our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Nothing, my lord. <laughs> Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Where's my daughter? By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? You are old. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state. Thou art my daughter, rather a disease that's in my flesh! Fly, brother. Fly! <laughs> Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak and despised old man! To whose hands you have sent the lunatic king? Oh. <laughs> I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Okay, so the first part of this review is going to be spoiler-free. Now, I know most of you have already seen or read King Lear as a play before, uh, but for those who haven't, or for those who don't want me to say specific things about how the film is made, uh, I will leave spoilers for later on. So I'll speak generally about the film, and then give it a letter grade, and then I'll get into spoiler territory after that. So first, I'd like to talk about the things that I liked, and there are many things that I liked about this film adaptation. The first thing that I liked about this film adaptation is that it is super accessible. It moves at a really brisk pace, it's updated to a contemporary setting, and the script is really well cut and edited so that it focuses on the plot and the characters and keeps things really moving along. I also really liked how the light design and the cinematography did a lot of heavy lifting to help us understand the environment and the world of this film, the world that King Lear takes place in. With the lighting and the cinematography, it really showcases how bleak and how harsh this world is. I also really want to point out that the performances were really solid all around. I feel like all of the actors did a great job. I really liked Anthony Hopkins' performance as King Lear. I found it to be nuanced. I found him to have a lot of range, both from what you would expect from King Lear, a lot of rage, a lot of anger, but also a lot of introspection. Emma Thompson and Emily Watson uh, really excelled in their roles, in particular in their reaction shots. I thought they did a marvelous job of showing us the subtext of what was happening in the scene. When the camera would show them reacting to the things that Lear was doing, it spoke volumes um, of their relationship with him and really did a nice job of filling in the gaps 
where the script didn't tell us everything about their relationship, their reactions told us everything we needed to know. One particular acting choice that I wasn't sure about at first, but I came to appreciate, was casting an older actor to play the fool. Typically, we see the fool played as a younger man or even a boy. King Lear himself describes the fool as boy quite often in the play. And so casting an older actor in that role was a little bit jarring for me at first. But then as we got a little further along in their relationship, particularly in a scene where they're joking together and telling riddles, um, I started to see a deep connection between them and a mutual understanding that was deeper than what you would usually get if the fool was played as a boy. Uh, there was something about them relating to one another that was really meaningful, uh, more so than, than how I've seen that relationship done in other productions, so kudos for that. I also really liked the use of locations in this film. I thought they did a really great job of filming in locations that could both show up as contemporary through the use of furniture and decorations and things, but where the architecture was really, really classic, giving the play uh, an older feel of being the classic that it is. And so, through the use of locations, they were able to combine the contemporary setting with the classical nature of the literature, and I really appreciated that. But, unfortunately, there are some things about this film that didn't really work for me. One was the use of direct address. Now, I'm, I'm always one who struggles with the use of direct address in film adaptations of Shakespeare. I think direct address works beautifully on stage. I love soliloquies directed, directed to the audience, directed directly to the audience. I love... Uh, when we get an aside to the audience to really show us the inner workings of a character. In a film, I always feel a little awkward about the actor looking directly into the camera because the actors and the audience aren't literally sharing the same space. There's a separation there that, that doesn't ring true for me and, and hasn't really in any film version of Shakespeare. Having said that, though, um, usually when I'm watching a film adaptation of Shakespeare, I can kind of get over it and accept that as a convention and just deal with it throughout the rest of the film. This time, however, the film was inconsistent in how it used direct address. We got direct address pretty early in the film with Edmund talking directly to the camera with uh, the Thou Nature Art My Goddess speech. Uh, it was a little jarring, though, because it felt like it came out of nowhere. It didn't feel of a piece with what had come before it. But then that idea of speaking directly to the camera kind of gets ditched a little while later, where future soliloquies are not addressed to the camera at all, but are instead treated as voiceovers while we get shots of what's happening um, instead of the actor looking directly into the camera. And then finally, at the end, direct address is brought back again. Um, but I feel like the film doesn't really make a choice about what direct address means and how it's going to be utilized. Or if it did, it's not a choice that really made sense to me in the moment of watching it. To me, it just felt arbitrary. Oh, he's looking at the camera now. Oh, he's not looking at the camera now. Why? In addition to that, another thing that felt a little bit like a mixed bag for me was the world development of the film. I mentioned earlier that it is updated to a contemporary setting. I, I actually applaud that. I think that works well. Typically, I think it gives an, the audience an in into this world and doesn't hold them at, at arm's length as a, as a classical setting sometimes can. However, uh, I didn't feel like the world was fully developed here. Um, we see the people immediately surrounding Lear, and we get some shots of people in poverty. So we know it's a full world, but we never see the middle class. We don't have a sense of how most of the people in this nation actually live. And what I think is most lacking is a sense of how the populace is responding to the events of the play. There's some really big stuff that happens in this play. Stuff that if it was to actually happen nowadays in the United States, where I am, uh, or in England, or really anywhere, the population would be aware of it, and it would be the talk of the country. People would be glued to their TVs or their devices or their phones or whatever, trying to figure out what was happening and what was going to happen next. And here, I had literally no sense of whether or not the populace even knew 
about the events of the play or how it affected them. And I feel like that's a pretty big hole in world development. And then the last kind of general thing that I will uh, offer some criticism for in the film is how the brisk pace of the play, which I think was ultimately a positive, affected some of the moments of the play negatively. So this film, as I mentioned, moves really, really fast. In fact, the whole film, with credits and everything, is less than two hours long. And that's that's quite remarkable. I mean, this is a big play that addresses some really big issues, goes over a lot of territory thematically and literally. And to be able to do that in under two hours is quite an achievement. However, in getting the play down to two hours or less, unfortunately, they really skim over some moments that I feel like are important that aren't allowed to land. It feels like the pace is just go, go, go um, until the end. And there are very few and far between moments where the characters can really react to what's happening around them uh, without the plot being driven forward at the same time. And one of the most heartbreaking things about the play King Lear is watching Lear try to come to terms with what's happening to him and try to come to terms with what is happening within him and around him. And the film really doesn't give time for that to be explored in a way that is as heartbreaking and as rich as it can be in a production that is going to be willing to take a little bit more time with it. So, Overall, even though I've just offered some criticisms, I do think the film works well. I think it's accessible. Now, I don't think it's going to make any large scores of new converts to Shakespeare. I feel like if you really want to bring in a whole new flock of people to Shakespeare, you've got to do it in like a totally out there, uh, extremely stylistic or poppy way. And a couple of films that come to mind that I think had the capacity to do that were Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet and um, Julie Taymor's uh, adaptation of Titus Andronicus also starring Anthony Hopkins. I feel like those films were so stylized and so out there that they allowed audiences to see Shakespeare in a new way. I'm not sure this one does that, but it is, I think, very serviceable. It is well performed. It is well shot. I think it's a, a really overall an excellent production, uh, and I'm going to give it a grade of a B. So now I'm going to go into some spoiler territory. So if you're not interested in getting down to the nitty gritty and my thoughts about specific things or hearing about how specific things were done, then maybe go watch the film and then come back to this point. All right, so here we go. So right from the beginning of the play, the director does a really great job of establishing that King Lear is in a state of mental decline. Um, the director really sets this up in a few ways in the opening scene of the play. First, by showing us the juxtaposition of aged King Lear standing next to a bust of his younger self. It shows uh, Lear having trouble drawing and writing on the map that he's using to divide up the kingdom. His handwriting is shaky. His daughters uh, are looking at him questionably. And the reactions of the daughters and everybody else in the room to what King Lear is saying and doing goes a long way to show us that they all know that he's in mental decline and they're all concerned about it. So right from the beginning, we get a really clear sense of Lear's decline. And I think that's excellently captured. Another thing that the director does, or maybe it's Anthony Hopkins that, that brought this to the table, is Lear is set up in early scenes as an abusive person. And the play makes it very clear that he's abusive emotionally. And you can't ignore that in the play. But here in the film, the director, or Anthony Hopkins, has gone further to also make him sexually abusive um, by some inappropriate kissing, some inappropriate touching, some, some very awkward things that he does, particularly with Goneril, uh, but also with Albany. Um, and the way that she reacts to him and the way Regan reacts to him makes it clear that he has been an abusive person uh, prior to his decline. And I think that does much to sell the turn of the sisters later in the play that without that would seem very jarring uh, where they go from having reasonable concerns about his hundred nights to being okay with him going out in the storm and you know 
farewell, good riddance, let's keep him locked out. Now, one area where the director made some choices that I didn't think worked are in the realm of the modern, the modernization of the setting. So oftentimes, and this was done in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet, it's done in theater productions all the time, where you'll take a Shakespeare play and you'll set it in a contemporary time, uh, which I'm all for. I think it's a, a great way to do Shakespeare. However, if you're going to introduce a modern thing, like a piece of technology or an item that didn't exist back then, um, you, once you've introduced that into the play or the film, it's in the film now, and you can't then pretend it's not there anymore. And, and in this play, there's the introduction of cars, which I think is fine. It makes sense where they use cars generally. But when King Lear arrives at Regan's house uh, in the scene where they basically say, you can't have your knights anymore, and he leaves and runs out in the storm, he actually arrives at Regan's house in a car. We see the car pull up, we see it park, we see him get out, and the car stays where it is. And yet, when he flees out into the storm, the car's not there anymore, and everybody seems to assume that he's going to go out into the wilderness unprotected in a storm. And neither Lear, nor Fool, nor Kent, nor any of the people who see him leave think or say, oh, there's the car he arrived in, he can just get in that and be safe from the storm. The film just introduces a car and then forgets about it. Another choice the director made that I think was the right impulse but wasn't done very well uh, was the decision to put two death scenes that are, are traditionally done off stage, uh, put them on camera uh, instead of having them happen off camera. And those would be the death of the fool and the death of Gloucester. Now, the fool in the play doesn't actually die, the fool just disappears. Some scholars think that the fool probably died, um, but it's never explicitly stated. Here in this film, the director has decided to have the fool just die, I guess, of a heart attack? Maybe? In the last scene that the fool appears in in the play. Um, and I think that's fine, but it's not really done in a way that has any impact. Uh, the fool is there, the fool lies down, and then he's not breathing anymore. And there's not much of a reaction to it. There's not much of a setup for why that happened. It just happens. He's just not there anymore. He's just not alive anymore. And then later in the play, they have the death of Gloucester on screen. And in the play, the death of Gloucester is just described by Edmund. Edmund comes out and says, Oh, I told my father who I am, and he died out of joy and sorrow. His heart burst. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, in the film, they decided to show that, which I understand. I get the impulse. It's more cinematic to show it on screen than to describe it later. However, I didn't think it was done in a, a poignant or clear way. Um... Edgar decides to put Gloucester's hand on his face so that Gloucester can feel him and realize it's him, and then Gloucester just stops breathing. But it's not given an opportunity to have impact. It just, it just, it just it felt like something was missing to make it happen. Um, and I guess this is of particular interest to me because in two productions of King Lear, I have actually played the roles of Edgar and the roles of Gloucester. Bonus, here's a picture of me as Gloucester from a grad school production. So because I've played these two roles, I'm probably more sensitive to how they are portrayed than I am to the rest of the film. Um, but another area that I was a little bit disappointed with was the... Uh, the Cliffs of Dover scene, the scene where Gloucester attempts to commit suicide. And I thought it was well acted. I thought the, the location was beautiful. I thought so much of it was well done, but it felt like there was a shot or two missing. It felt incomplete. Um, we saw, we see Gloucester like throw himself down, kind of, but we see it from his perspective and we see Edgar's reaction to it but we don't actually see Gloucester like fall onto the ground. We're supposed to understand that he did fall until we see that he didn't, but we don't actually ever actually have a shot of him just on the ground, having thrown himself on the ground. 
uh, it, it just feels like there's something missing. It feels like they didn't get enough coverage when shooting the scene and that they need to just reshoot a portion of it and probably didn't have the budget to do it for it to have maximum impact. However, a scene that is beautifully done that I really enjoyed was the scene where they uh, take out Gloucester's eyes, which is a very dark scene, uh, but I feel like they did it really well. And the thing that I liked about it was that it was very clear what was happening, and it was a very intense scene, but it wasn't grotesque. They didn't dwell on the on gore or anything, but it was very clear what was happening. I thought it was done very artfully, also intense enough to have some impact. And then I felt like the short fight between the servant in the script, who's a soldier in the film, uh, against Cornwall in response to what Cornwall is doing was really well done. I thought it was well staged, uh, well choreographed, and even though it was a brief fight, I thought it was very effective and, and, and clean and sharp and very clear. So well done on that particular sequence. Uh, I really liked that. And now I want to talk a little bit more about Anthony Hopkins' performance as King Lear, which earlier I said was good, and I still stand by that. I think it was good. But one thing that I didn't quite like about about his performance as Lear was the, the performance didn't seem to build. It felt like it kind of peaked at the beginning and then kind of went mm, meh. Uh, it didn't really climax. And uh, particularly the howl, howl, howl monologue at the end, I often think of that as being a really big, really heart-wrenching monologue. Um, I mean, it literally begins with him yelling howl, howl, howl. But Anthony Hopkins chose to do it in a very different way. And again, I think him doing it differently is fine. It just didn't work for me. He chose to portray it in a very kind of understated, almost humorous, borderline sarcastic way that, I don't know, it just didn't resonate for me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get any of the feels. I didn't feel like he was really going through anything. It just felt like, oh, she's dead. All right. And it just, it felt like his performance, which I was really on board with, just kind of petered out and disappeared. Um, so that was frustrating to me. But overall, other than that, uh, there was a lot I really liked about what he was doing. So there you go. There's a lot of my thoughts on this particular film of King Lear. I think it is good overall. I think it's very accessible. The pace moves along really well. I think the cinematography and the color and the lighting do an excellent job of capturing the bleakness and harshness of the world. Um, and I thought it was really well performed. And if you're looking for an updated version of King Lear, I think, I think you could do worse than this. So I hope you're able to check it out. Uh, if you are interested in more of what I have to say about the play King Lear, I've done two other videos on the play, and I will put them in the comments below. Uh, if you like what I'm doing here at this channel, feel free to like and subscribe. And if you want to continue the conversation about this film adaptation, if you have thoughts after seeing it yourself, I'd love to get your comments below. Fare you well. I commend you to your own content.